Well, Northern Ireland is once again in the news. Uh, unsurprisingly, of course, because, well, <laughs> as we've expressed many, many times, the deal that Johnson did, and not only supported by at the time the Brexiteers, the DUP, was that this deal was oven ready, that this was perfect, this was the solution to all the problems. You know, Northern Ireland, not going to be an issue once we get this deal done. Of course. Of course, it still very, very much is. And whether this be by uh, on purpose design by Johnson and the Brexiteers so that they could at least have a continuing discussion about Brexit and just keep on on that, as we've said before, the merry-go-round of Brexit. Just keep on bringing it up, stirring up these these ideas of, of nationalism and, and patriotism that, that Brexit, unfortunately, very brought with it in a very toxic way. Um, unfortunately, this seems to be the case. Um, they had no idea about what they were negotiating with, what the Good Friday Agreement even seemed to have been, or even how their deal would at least upset certain parts of, of the of the unionists in Northern Ireland, who were, of course, going to throw an absolute hissy fit the second that they realised there was a border in the Irish Sea. And I am not even convinced that the current deal, or at least the law-breaking that Johnson is currently um, actively seems to be engaged in, along with Liz Truss, is even going to be able to appease the DUP. I've said it before, and I will say it again, I highly suspect that the DUP are just ready to just cause crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis. I think they are desperate not to um, go into back into power sharing, and they are desperately trying to run out the clock so that they can have another election, so that they can try and at least maybe get back into um, you know, the first minister position. And if not, well, then they'll just go back and say, well... Johnson's deal that he's just done again doesn't work. So once again, starting that carousel on these uh, problems, just causing crisis after crisis after crisis until they get what they want. This is unfortunately how zealots work. It's exactly what happened with the Brexit zealots and the Brexiteers pushing in Parliament the way that they did for Brexit. And they're acting in exactly the same way now in Northern Ireland, regardless of any of the consequences that they may bring with their actions. So today we're going to go over a really good uh, article written by a guy called um, Peter, uh, yeah, let me just make sure I've got it right, Peter Hain. And Peter Hain was a negotiator. He was heavily involved in the, uh, in the um, not the disillusionment, um, the devolvement settlement to give Stormont at least, you know, more power uh, in the sort of in the region. Um, and help set stuff up there. So this is the type of expert, again, according to Michael Gove, that we've had enough of. But as we've heard and said before on, on this channel, the problems currently facing the Northern Ireland Protocol are not impossible to solve. What they really need is the government and the EU and, again, Stormont to sit down and go, OK, here are the problems. Let's sit down. Let's negotiate them. Because these problems aren't huge. They're really tiny problems, but they're really tiny technical problems. And the problem is, is those don't make, for shall we say, the good flashy headlines. But if you can make have a headline that says Brexit problem or Brexit's being, you know, cancelled or stopped, that makes a far more interesting headlines for the likes of, well, Boris Johnson, certainly. But we're going even into here. And this, I think, goes to show you negotiation is possible. It is absolutely possible, but our government is just not interested in doing it. So before we go uh, heading into this, uh, please do remember to hit that like, share and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there is a link to my Patreon page and a one off station link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can well buy me coffee. And as always, thank you very much to all those people who do help and support the channel that way. So this comes from The Guardian, with the title of I negotiated a Northern Ireland deal that worked and Johnson's Putinist strategy will wreck it. There is something Putinesque about the government's framing of its Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. It is almost the opposite of what Boris Johnson, his man in Belfast, Brandon Lewis, and the hardline backbenchers he's trying to appease uh, claim it to be. Leave it to one side that it trashes Britain's reputation and that it was conceived in London as a solution to the Northern Ireland Brexit conundrum. 
that it reneges on the very withdrawal agreement that Johnson and his lieutenant David Frost negotiated with the EU, and never mind that it breaks international treaties the UK signed. Forget the very old-fashioned notion of truth. Sticking to your word and truth must be uh, obeying international law. Instead, focus upon its real purpose, the dog whistling to Johnson's base by triggering a humongous row with the old villain Brussels because that worked so well in the 2016 Brexit referendum. Keep that going. And if at all possible, all the way to the next general election. Johnson's chanters uh, uh, that the protocol breaches the Good Friday Agreement. Yet in his own bill, amending that it is the opposite by all the main northern political parties, except, of course, the Democratic Unionist Party, by the business community, which fears yet even more disruption and instability, and by civil society groups that have been trying to make the protocol work. It's not that the EU has been gridlocking negotiations to get rid of the protocol's rough edges. It's Johnson's failure, along with Frost, and now it is Liz, uh, now Liz Truss, to negotiate seriously. Uh, having myself fully negotiated as a, uh, as a government minister with the EU, all the parties in Northern Ireland, and again the UN Secretary Council, winning good deals for Britain. I know that building trust is key to getting concessions from either side, but Boris Johnson uh, and all that have destroyed trust in Brussels, Belfast, Dublin, and even Washington, D.C., and this just goes to show you the damage this is really doing, because he's right. He's absolutely 100% right. If you do not have trust in your other side who you're negotiating with, how can you actually trust them to stick to the letter of the law, or at least these, these deals? Remember, at the start, he said this was, oh, very Putin-esque. Remember, you had Minsk 1 and Minsk 2, two deals that were signed by Russia and Ukraine that said that were meant to, again, avoid war. But Putin just trashed both of them, and look at where we are now over in Ukraine. Um, there is no trust between those two sides at the moment. And, of course, now it is a war. And, of course, well, we hope it doesn't come to that over here or at least, you know, start sparking some serious trouble. But when trust is gone, it becomes almost impossible to negotiate. And the very key fact is what has again been said here. It is down to Johnson and Liz Truss to start negotiating seriously. And the problem is they are not. So anyway, we continue with the article. So, why should Brussels make concessions necessary when it suspects that Johnson will simply pick, pocket these up and then up the ante again? The EU is far from blameless in all this mess, but it is very ready to make changes. It is offered to do so and included a willingness to explore the red and green channels, respectively for goods entering into the EU across the Irish border and those confined to Northern Ireland alone. There is a deal to be done. We've taken the shed loads of evidence in our protocol on the Northern Ireland uh, and to the, sub to the subcommittee in the Lords confirming that. And we know the protocol is working, by the way. It is, if you take London out of the equation, um, Northern Ireland is one of the currently the most prosperous areas in the UK. Why? Because it's still in the EU. You know, that... That has been proven that it is working, and part of the reason why the Brexiteers are so desperate to get rid of it, they can't just go, oh, it's not working economically, because no, it very clearly is, is because they are worried that, as you can see, it's in the single market, it's in the customs union, it is working very well compared to the rest of the UK. They know the numbers, they've seen the numbers, and they are worried that if that remains the case, it could be used as a, as well, as a case that, well, why isn't the rest of the UK in the single market customs union? And then once you're going back into that, well, why aren't we in the EU full time then? And that's what they're so terrified about. That is, I think, still one of the major key points uh, that is really being up here and that why they are so desperate to trash the Northern Ireland Protocol in this case. So anyway, we'll continue with the article. So the question is, does Johnson really want one? <laughs> That is the question. Or does he prefer the parallel universe uh, blame game that resonates with his supporters and won't solve the problem? 
because to do so would irrevocably mean that the comparisons like the ones he and Frost made in signing the protocol in the first place. The truth is that Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, were, uh, well, sorry, the truth is Northern Ireland uh, always was going to be Brexit's Achilles heel because after Brexit, Europe's external frontier had to be somewhere. For England, it would be Calais. For Northern Ireland, it would have to be either across the island of Ireland, a toxic, unthinkable, undeliverable in Brussels, Dublin, and even Washington, D.C., because it would ditch the Good Friday Agreement peace process. Or it would be in the Irish Sea, which Boris Johnson casually opted for to, quote, get Brexit done. And that is the main discussion we've been having since day dot. That has been the main discussion point. Where is this border going to be? If um, you are going to Brexit and you're going to do this deal, where are you going to put the border? You cannot have one between the North of Ireland and the Republic, because again, the Good Friday Agreement, it will not wash in Brussels, it will not wash in Dublin, and it will certainly not sit well in Washington, D.C. So you have to have it in the sea. And of course, that is where it was going to be. But of course, remember Boris Johnson's comment that no prime minister would ever be able to stomach such a thing. And of course, that was in very much responses to May's idea on the backstop deal that she was doing. So anyway, it continues. So what might be the solution? Start with the roots of the problem. Johnson's dogmatic insistence upon a hard Brexit that required the UK to, quote, take back control and break free from EU rules, whether on food, uh, food safety or manufacturing standards. Yet, the integrity of the EU single market requires that those rules be respected and legally enforceable. So Johnson's very own Brexit means that there has to be some sort of customs and regulatory border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And, uh, control it uh, and control of it under the supposedly in, uh, in <laughs> the uh, insidious protocol has been delegated uh, by the EU for the very first time to a non-member state, the UK. Remember also that there have been a long light touch controls on the movement of the plans and the livestock from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. A border of sorts has necessitated uh, by the by, the island of Ireland being in a single and distinct biosphere. Indeed, uh, oh, 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 sorry, wait, 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 sorry, lost my place there. Uh, where we? So, uh, some give and take could resolve this current problem over the food products coming from Great Britain into Belfast or Lane, or, or Lane in that matter, and uh, that did not leave the Unionists understandably feeling that the identity was being threatened by being separated from the rest of the UK. Again, always comes back to that problem. Uh, certainly, um, on the ground, the unions feel that they their identity is being threatened. And uh, we always say this. There's a lot of people who just go, oh, yeah, United Island, that solves the problem. No, 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 my friends. That could open up a whole new can of problems. Um and certainly we've talked about that uh, before on this channel, but that will go into, that will start a whole new conversation. But anyway, we could, we'll talk about that probably another time, but we'll continue with this. Um, the time-consuming paperwork could easily be replaced by electronic fast-tracking of goods if London was willing to share data in real time with Brussels, something that Johnson has so far refused to do. So remember, there are solutions on the table, but Johnson is refusing to do them. Why is he refusing to do them? It's because he wants to look tough. He wants to keep that Brexit drum beating again and again. Uh, according to legal advice that we've seen in our Lords Committee, the amendments to the protocol are possible and within the withdrawal treaty. And if trust is rebuilt, a big task given Johnson's dishon dishonesty and posturing, I'm sure the EU could agree to them. But how can it be reasonably expected to do so when the bill gives the UK ministers massive unilateral powers to change anything they deem, uh, deem necessary in the protocol, an international treaty? Then there is the, quote, democratic deficit. The DUP complained that the rules will be made in Brussels over which Northern Ireland has no say. Fair point. The answer is to give Northern Ireland ministers and legislators 
the consultative rights both in Brussels institutions, both through joining a joint UK-EU committee overseeing the protocol and through adopting the existing cross-border bodies in Dublin. Remember that Northern Ireland voted in 2016 to stay in the EU, not for Brexit, and out of the five main political parties, only one backed Johnson's hard Brexit, the DUP. And polls show that most people in Northern Ireland support the protocol. All the parties want it amended, its implications, its implications smoothed, so that Northern Ireland, now with a much faster economic growth than either England, Scotland or Wales, will continue to enjoy the best of both worlds in the UK and the EU single market as the protocol delivers. But remember also that Johnson's express objectives is for the UK to diverge from EU regulations. That means that Northern Ireland diverging the increasingly rest from the UK, and that is unsettling for the DUP, but then it voted for it. So, what pains me the most is to see the current batch of Tory leaders don't really give a fig for Northern Ireland. They don't even understand it. They don't even know how to play the honest broker role that John Major uh, extolled and even Joni, ex extolled and obviously Tony Blair exemplified. I generally feel that the 2007 devolution statement that I helped negotiate under Blair that had ended the horror and commitment to and cemented hope, we felt that by bringing the old uh, blood enemies together, the DUP and Sinn Féin, Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, to share government together, the Good Friday Agreement would be locked in and over time would deepen peace, stability and inclusive democracy. Sadly, with the vandals now in charge of Britain run amok, I'm not so sure anymore. And you've got to think, you've got to feel for this guy who negotiated, um, like, this deal. You've really got to feel for him when you see um, people like Boris Johnson in charge and even Liz Truss wrecking what must have been uh, years of hard work and even seeing it since then work. And then you get now destroying all that good work you've done. It must be absolutely heart-wrenching for, for this guy to see. Um, but unfortunately, this is this exact same conversation we always have, right from the very beginning. Go back to 2016. Northern Ireland's not going to be an issue. Why is it not going to be an issue? Oh, well, the UK is going to stay in the single market and customs union. Remember, Daniel Hanan, only a fool, talks about leaving the single market and customs union. And of course, when uh, you know Remain brought it up that that's what they intended, um, the Leave campaign came out and said, "No, we're not going to leave the single market and customs union." <laughs> so the entire twenty sixteen um, great practice of democracy uh, was a complete lie based on pure fabrications of a side that wanted to try and win as many votes as it could to declare the quote will of the people, because, of course, again, you can't have another referendum, apparently, uh, to see if that's really what people wanted, or, you know, make sure, well, do we really want to leave the single market customs union? We can't be doing that now. So, of course, this um, saga will very, very much continue. The solutions are there. The negotiation is possible. We've just seen it from a guy who was in charge of negotiations laying out the fact that, yes, negotiation is possible, it is doable, but there has to be trust on both sides, and almost certainly Johnson is unwilling to show any trust at all, because he's just untrustable. And even if the EU did give him some concessions, what's to say that, as Ken pointed out in the article, hoover them up and then just go, I want more? Because unfortunately... When you're dealing with zealots in any type of revolution, they push always, push, push, push for the hardest possible solution. You've only got to look at the French Revolutionary War. Starting off as, let's curb the powers of the king. You know, we, we, we're not going to get rid of the king, we're still going to keep the king. We want more, shall we say, constitutional powers, more checks put on these powers, um, and so on and so on. And then, the, the obviously the more and more and more it gets. And of course, you know, other stuff went on in the French Revolution, you know, Louis the uh, 16th, was it 16th or 17th? I can't remember. Um, didn't do himself any favours by the way he acted. Um, but of course, the, the revolutionary just kept on pushing and pushing and pushing. And of course, you end up with 
uh, you know, Robespierre, you end up with the terrors, all kinds of, of stuff. And then, of course, Napoleon comes in and declares the revolution is over. Um, and yeah, it's the same for any revolution. Very often, unfortunately, in many cases, revolutions do not go the way they were intended. And very often, the revolutionaries end up being eaten by their own revolution, which is exactly what is going on here at the moment with Brexit. So, as always, uh, thank you very much for watching. Please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there is a link to my Patreon page and a donation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can well buy me coffee. And as always, thank you very much to all those people who do help and support the channel that way. So, as always, we'll see you all next time.